So welcome or welcome back, everyone, to session three of our Comics and Digital Culture series in our first uh, engagement here with Emerald City Comic Con. Um, we've been hearing um, some interesting things on the business side of comics, and the, se the last two of our uh, uh, parts of our program are going to be talking about the ways that digital media is expanding the creative and uh, some of the more interesting uh, storytelling aspects of comics um, by integrating things like interactivity and multilingualism and uh, motion and things like that, um, sort of augmenting the traditional sequential art format with these and coming out with stuff that is much more of the than the sum of its parts. Um, this next uh, feature, Dim Sum Warriors, came to my attention, I don't know, uh, two or three years ago, um, right after, I don't know, sure it was after my book came out or um, right when it was about to come out and I was looking for cool projects and it was like, oh my gosh, this is, this is really interesting because it combines so many different uh, aspects of what comics can do for, as storytelling, what comics can do as education, what comics in a global uh, marketplace looks like, and then never without ever sacrificing the real sort of warmth and storytelling humor. And the, the people responsible for this are uh, Yen Yen Wu and Colin Goh, who are um, originally from Singapore, where they um, uh, had some successful media properties that they can tell you about as well, and then uh, came to the United States, and Yen Yen is a, um, a professor, uh, sorry, associate, professor associate professor at Long Island University, Long Island University in New York. Um, they're going to be talking to you and showing you Dim Sum Warriors and uh, about all of the cool things that it does. Thank you. Colin and Yen, take it away. Thank, Thank you. you. Uh, so, hi, I'm Yen Yen. So this is Colin, and we're a husband and wife team that's behind Dim Sum Warriors. Uh, so that's our contact information in case you need to get in touch with us. Um, by the way, anybody who's under 15 gets a free book today. Oh. <laughs> oh incidentally, this is our uh, boss, uh, and uh, sh she runs the show, and she's our inspiration, and um, also our taskmaster. <laughs> so. <clears throat> so anyway, uh, thank you again for inviting us here to Seattle. We are, we are very grateful to Rob and Scott and the University of Washington uh, Communication Leadership Program. Um, this has been a very fascinating series, uh, it, and I, I, I begin to see the progression. Uh, we first sat down and we watched Ted Adams of IDW talk about having large uh, commercial properties being integrated into uh, various um, formats, and then we just heard um, Alison Baker of Monkey Brain talk about uh, presenting different creators' works, uh, again, in, in multiple ways. And we are kind of the Etsy <laughs> of, of, of digital comics, I guess. We, our, our comic in that story. We, do, we do everything ourselves. So from trying to get it on different platforms, creating it, marketing it, we do everything ourselves. Yeah. I, you know, it was always going to, we knew right from the beginning, it was always going to be a tough sell to have a comic, uh, have one of the regular comic book publishers take on basically kung fu fighting dumplings. <laughs> it was, all, you know, it was a little, it was a, it was a r step too far, I guess. So, but that's what our comic is about. It's about three young dumplings uh, from left to right there. You have uh, Sia Jiao, who's a shrimp dumpling. Um, the big fella in the center is uh, Prince Rose Pok Bao. And Cha Shao Bao in Mandarin. <laughs> and uh, Shao Mai, who's a, uh, he's actually a shrimp and pork dumpling. Mm -hmm. And they're, they're sort of the holy trinity of dim sum to anyone who has been to a, um, a, a you know, Chinese restaurant uh, uh, at the weekend. Um, You've you got to have these three. And they battle an evil pot of instant ramen <laughs> because we all know how evil ramen can be. Um, it's delicious, but it's evil. <laughs> so that's him stewing in his uh, own juices there. That's our villain, uh, Colonel Quickie Noodle. <clears throat> then, of course, this being a big martial arts adventure, we have the Warring Clans. So we have the Fried Kong Academy, all those uh, crispy fellows over here. Uh, we have the Baked Kong Sisterhood. And we have the Boil Kong Temple, so I, I guess the stand-in for the Shaolin uh, Temple. And our heroes are the School of Steam Kong, who are the worst of the lot. 
since the school has really fallen in hard times. Uh, the fellow in the back over there, uh, his name is Chickenfoot, but he prefers to be addressed as Phoenix Claw. The, this is actually true. If you've been to a Chinese restaurant, that's what chicken feet are referred to. They're always Phoenix Claws. So yes, a little bit of uh, flim flam marketing for you there. Anyway, um, the reason, I guess, why we were invited here is because it's not that we were crazy enough to think up you know, kung fu fighting dumplings, um, but rather that we chose to first release Dim Sum Warriors as an iPad app. And as an iPad app that is more than just uh, basically a, a glorified PDF. This is, um, it's an iPad app that also supports the learning of Mandarin and which also helps um, teach uh, Chinese speakers how to uh, speak English as well. So that, uh, that w that's the concept behind uh, Dim Sum Warriors. And this is how the app works. How trashy can some people get? That's the third handy wipe you've broken. Those are my fingers, those are my hands actually. Um, and so what we tried to do was to retain the, the idea of a comic page, because uh, we love what you know Scott McCloud talks about, the simultaneity of the page, you're seeing everything at one go at the same time. So we're wondering how do we include interactivity without things moving, kind of keeping, we, we were not big fans of the guided view where you see parts of the page, we wanted to see the whole page at the same time, so we decided how about if we make the word balloons tappable, because they are speech balloons, right? So what if you can hear audio through the word balloon? So every word balloon that you tap, you can hear audio and you can tap on it again to see the translation and hear the translation. And we definitely wanted to preserve the reading aspect of it. I think there has been a tendency with apps to approach movies and TV, TV shows, um, and we wanted to preserve reading. We wanted the, uh, all the readers to be able to follow the word balloons, go through the text as well, and um, uh, that was the thinking behind it. So, but quite apart from the educational aspects, the amazing thing which uh, the previous two sp speakers uh, also touched on is that the wonderful thing about releasing your comic in app form is it's suddenly available in 50 countries instantly. And that's something that's really hard to achieve with uh, traditional distribution. We got downloads, we were really amazed. We, when we started getting downloads, we were getting downloads from places not just uh, in the US and and China and Hong Kong, like we initially thought. We were getting them from Saudi Arabia. We were getting them from countries we had never heard of. I remember the day Yen said, you know, we have a download from the Republic of Palau. And I said, where on earth is that? And, you know, as it turns out, it's a tiny Micronesian island. And it, it's, it's really fascinating. And you begin to have conversations with people really from all over the world. But the other interesting thing was, despite the app, everybody who purchased the app also said, do you have this in a print edition? Which we didn't expect. We thought everything had moved to digital, but really everybody really wanted the books. So having uh, completely run out of money after investing our, our sweat equity into the app, um, we, had, we decided we, you know, we didn't have money left to publish a book, so we, went, we ha ran a Kickstarter campaign. And, um, yeah, so the Kickstarter <coughs> campaign raised uh, money for us. We were able to print volumes one and two of uh, Dim Sum Wars, which I'm going to give to the kids in the room right now. Well, while we're at it, <laughs> here you go. So Kickstarter was obviously a very, very um, <clears throat> important and also a slightly nerve-wracking experience for us. Uh, the, uh, the main problem of which was we launched a Kickstarter on the very first day that Hurricane Sandy hit our hometown of New York. In fact, the first fatality of Hurricane Sandy was in our neighborhood. Um, when a tree fell on a, a house uh, a few streets away. And we thought, oh, well, that's it. Um, 
we can't possibly get any press, which is true. We didn't get any press, uh, local press whatsoever. And also, we felt kind of bad asking people to donate to a graphic novel when you know their houses were ruined. But we are very, very grateful. You know, so thank you, Internet. Um, we managed to raise uh, money not just to print one volume, but two volumes. So we have actually picked up a quite a lot of press since. Uh, we've been on Time, uh, BBC, uh, uh, PRI, NPR, and the New York Times has featured us. Um, got quite a lot of quotes as well. And we're now available in multi multiple formats, not just the iPad, but there's print. There's the Kindle edition with the guided view. Uh, and the Kindle uh, edition actually also works on the iPhone, so that, but it just doesn't have the, the interactive uh, language features are only on the iPad at the moment. Uh, once we make enough money, I guess uh, we and will be Android moving to Android. Nice, yes. So, yeah. so here's the secret origin of Dim Sum Warriors, though it begins with her. Uh, and that's our boss. Uh, she's right at the back over there playing uh, behind um, yet another superhero. Um, hello, Ang. Good to see you. <laughs> Glad you could drop by. Um, yes, um, the reason why we created this wasn't because we were uh, uh, grand comic creators or, or anything of that sort. Um, she basically jump-started everything because, um, well, before, before we started any of this, we were actually filmmakers. Uh, Yen is a professor. Uh, well, before that, he was a lawyer, I was a professor. Uh, oh, I am still a professor of yes, education. Right. We still and have day jobs. We still have day jobs. And, um, and uh, you know, when, when our baby came, uh, you know, we're alone in New York with no family, and we're like, we have to do something. We need to create. We have this, like, we have to make something. What do we make? And Colin had been cartooning for, like, many, many years, 17 years at that point, 20. and 20 years. <laughs> and yeah. um, I had a gag strip yeah. in the newspapers, but not for a single second did I ever think of drawing a full comic, which was kind of strange. Uh, but it was only after she came along and we realized, you know, there's no way we can continue making films. In fact, uh, she was born just as we were in um, development of the next our, very, our very first uh, New York film. We were going to shoot a, a movie right in New York, and we're gearing up for that. And she came along, and we, uh, we knew how crazy the schedules would be like making movies. And sh the, the incredible thing was she came 10 weeks ahead of time. There was no third trimester. She was born very prematurely, and we were scared out of our skulls. Um, so we decided to shelve the filmmaking to focus on just getting her better. And as you can see, she's fine. Um, but at that time, we really didn't know. Um, so we shelved that and decided we still needed to do something. And we wanted to do something to honor her because she was, you know, we wanted her to be a fighter. And she was a fighter. And we also thought, OK, so what would this project be like? And we said it had to reflect her mixed heritage, I guess, now growing up as an ethnically Chinese um, little girl growing up in New York. Uh, and and we, uh, we live in Flushing, Queens, New York, uh, where it's, very str it's a very strange place because most people live between two worlds, at least linguistically and culturally. Um, so they speak multiple languages. They, uh, you know, it's it's a it's a it's a small town. Well, small town sub is it a suburb of no small part of New York City where where Ultraman moonlights as a noodle maker in the in the food court. Can you see Ultraman over there? So he actually cuts noodles and he makes noodles yes, over there. Right. Um, so it's a very strange world um, and. Our daughter is growing up in a world, and we are all living in a world now where culturally the paradigm is shifting. Uh, the cultural paradigm is shifting, where, where, where the center isn't the center anymore, uh, and so so we are finding that that's changing. And we are also living in a time when, um, according to Common Sense Media, a study by Common Sense Media, 40% of kids um, learn to use touch screens before they can speak. So they are using touch screens before they can speak. They're really digital natives who are so familiar with this, with, with this form. Um, and she and all the kids now are also growing up in a generation where, where visual communication and visual literacy is so important. It's such a big part of their lives. It's so important that in our everyday lives, we use, um, we use graphics. We use graphics to communicate our emotions even. 
Um, so, so it's a very kind of different world. Um, in the education world, for example, in my field, uh, I'm a professor of education, there's a big urgency and concern and interest in looking at how to use um, graphics and visuals to help kids um, express more complex thoughts. Um, there's a big uh, concern to, uh, to see how to use graphics, especially graphic novels, to engage second language learners or uh, readers who are not initially very interested in reading and uh, to get them very interested in reading. And they're finding great success with that. Here, here's a little bit of trivia. When we first launched the book in New York at Columbia University, um, we had, a, we had several of uh, Yen's old uh, fellow uh, education e experts talk about touch screens. And one of the funny things we learned was that there's a new, the current generation, the current kindergarten generation is completely different from the previous, uh, s what was it, of past ten, seven years? Yeah, seven years or so. So my friend who's a uh, who's, um, curriculum specialist for the New Jersey <coughs> schools, so he found that in one, Two years ago, suddenly in that year, all the kindergartners who got into school that year had lost a skill that in the previous seven years they all had. Can you guess what that skill, the lost skill is? No? Using the mouse. So they completely didn't know how to use the mouse. They would go to the um, computer screen and start swiping, you know. Yeah. Uh, we so found that fascinating, but that was clearly a shift. So we also began to notice something about our own daughters dealing with graphics, um, which, uh, you know, she be, we, that so was the initial reaction. Whatever she watched, whatever we read to her, she would begin drawing the stuff she saw and, and, and read. Yeah. And we began to notice that they weren't just simple drawings. There were, there were actual stories emerging from that. This was done when she was three. Uh, and that those are her obviously those are her favorite heroes of all time the the Powerpuff Girls. They live within the iPad, by the way. In this yeah, and that that whole black border <laughs> that's supposed to be the iPad. And um, so in this story, so I asked her what's going on in this picture, and she said, um, uh, Buttercup is dead. And I said, what happened? She said, Buttercup is dead because they had to fight monsters, and Buttercup realized that fighting is bad, so she stopped fighting. So she died because she stopped fighting, and. Uh, Blossom and Bubbles are very upset because they don't know that fighting is bad. So they carry on fighting and they're angry that Buttercup is dead. Um, it, and I'm like, this is a very complex, very complex thinking about life and death and so on. And I think, and what educators are beginning to find. <laughs> Speak of the... Yes. And what educators are beginning to find is that through graphics, kids can communicate deep, deep, complex thoughts that we didn't know, realize that they were thinking before. So through graphics, they're they are able to do that. So, re you know, as we were thinking of our creative project, we were merging all this kind of stuff, and um, it suddenly hit us, why on earth aren't we doing it in that most American of art forms, the, the great comic book? And as I said, I was drawing a newspaper gag strip for you know, over 20 years, but I hadn't done a real comic. And in fact, the reason why we came to the US was because I was a comic geek. There's a reason why we went to New York and, and not any, we didn't apply to anywhere else except New York because you know that's Gotham City, it's Spider-Man and stuff like that. And this was a way, I guess, of going back to my roots a little. Um, we also saw this as a little bit of a chance to address the horrible way that um, American comics have dealt with Asian characters. Uh, you know, there's clearly progress, as we see with uh, Ang, uh, <clears throat> much more respectful. But I do remember growing up, I actually had that uh, copy of Wonder Woman versus the evil Ig Fu. It used to bug the living heck out of me that Shang-Chi, the master of Kung Fu, who is still around, He's now an Avenger, and of course his name translates as Shang Chi, which literally means rising air. I know they've tried to finesse it by saying it's the rising and advancing of the spirit, but really it's just hot air going up. <laughs> you know, it's like check a dictionary, but obviously n not not a priority. So um, we wanted to mix stuff up. We we began thinking, okay, if we are going to do a comic, what are we going to do? It's got to be about something we really love. And after a lot of soul searching, we uh, love we love wuxia, which is like um, uh, Chinese sword fighting films and novels and and TV se serials. And at that point, when we we started writing the comic, 
I was also um, a Shaolin Kung Fu student, so I was practicing Shaolin Kung Fu, which I love being able to like do a turn kick, and it's like some kind of fantasy growing up of being able to do that. Guess kind who of won thing. all the arguments in the house? <laughs> uh, there were, of course, uh, Chinese uh, comics, mostly coming out of Hong Kong and Taiwan, but um, we found that they were very, to put it kindly, rudimentarily scripted. Most of them were. At least the ones we grew up with. Right? Yeah, yeah, at least the ones we grew up with uh, were, were just basically, you know, uh, 24 pages of nonstop fighting, um, which, well, come to think of it, um, some modern American comics are like that too. But um, so that's how we merged everything together in, into Dim Sum Warriors. And we also decided to make it a science fiction thing, which is not very typical in, in Kung Fu uh, <clears throat> in Kung Fu comics, uh, most of them tend to be, you know, set in some, um, uh, how shall I put it, hoary old chop uh environment where we decided to have fun with it and turn it into a science fiction uh, series as well. And when we were about to release, we did the comic first, but when we were about to release it, the iPad appeared. That's when we started thinking about all the language things because I, when I was in middle school, in order to understand, there were no, uh, when I was growing up, there were no translations of Japanese manga. Uh, and I had to sit there with my favorite manga with three different dictionaries, katakana, hiragana, and kanji, and I had to make sense of that. And it was a huge pain. It, you know, it, one dictionary would be bad enough, sit there with three different dictionaries, flipping back and forth just to understand this comic. But I loved the comic so much. And I also realized um, that translation paid a, played a, a large part in my choice of comics as well. I also grew up reading uh, the great French comics, uh, Asterix and, and Tintin, um, in English translation. And I remember reading Pogo and early Floyd Godfredson uh, Mickey Mouse comics as well. Those, those were very influential on me in, in learning English. I used to read Pogo and wonder, what on earth is that word? And realize they were transliterations, which helped my spelling, which made me check stuff back and forth, and I wanted to, we wanted to bring a little bit of that um, going deep into the text. I mean, you know, I was, I was a kid, but yet I would be puzzled by the way things were spelt, or the way, why, why it, you know, uh, the grammar went a certain way. And we wanted to replicate some of that in the app as well, which, which is why it was very much a focus on, on reading. Um, and that's, that's... One of the things that we decided to do was to not worry too much about keeping the language very simple. It's a lot of Chinese and a lot of English. We, we, we wanted to um, uh, be really respectful of what kids uh, can figure out um, and the way they can contextualize meaning through visuals. So the language is not very simple. It's actually fairly, fairly complex. And it's also a way of scaffolding, I guess. Uh, because you could read it at a certain age and get so much out of it, and you could read it later on and, and pick up even more, and, and that's what we've been finding is true. And here's something kind of interesting. So when we first had the, the prototype of the app, we decided to test it on our daughter. And this is, this is a, a little video of the first beta test. A five-minute video test. of her playing with the app when she was uh, three, three and a half. Stop! Ow! Uh, I'll definitely give the dummy back to you, but I don't know how to. As you wish. Chamai! Whoosh! Well, go to the this one. See this one, the corner. The corner. Press the corner square. You see the corner square? Okay, press it. Okay, then change your English. There you go. Stop! Hey! Wait! Hey! <laughs> One of the interesting things we notice is that there's a compulsion amongst all our kid readers to tap every single word. Glad to be of help. Let me also relieve you of this burdensome job. Ow, 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 Podsticker, please put me down. 
Why is he saying ow, ow, ow? Because, because his punch is pulling his shirt. Oh, okay. Say ow, ow, ow. Ow, 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 Pod Sticker, please put me down. Say ow, ow, Spot, spot Sticker, please put me down. Glad to be of help. Let me also relieve you of this burdensome dog. What did he say? The pot sticker? Yeah. He said, glad to be of help. Like, I'm glad to help you. Let me also relieve you. Relieve you means take away so that it's not so heavy for you. This burdensome doll means the doll is very heavy. So he said, I'll take it away from you. Yeah, but Xia Jia would not find him. I so nice, so he's, he's being cruel to, what's he doing? That's pot sticker, right? Pot yeah. sticker is a nasty one, isn't he? Yeah. What's he doing to Shao Mai? He's making, throwing Shao Mai away to his, and so he thinks Shao Mai doesn't need to be with Xia Xiao anymore. Yeah. He needs to, you know. Let me see. He said to you. Hang in there, Xiao Mai. Ah, I'm coming back. I'm taking a part. Ah, I'm coming back. I'm taking a part. I'm taking a part. What's that? 他拉了什么呢？裤子。裤子？谁的裤子啊？小马的裤子。哦。啊！你<笑>为什么会说啊呢？裤子下来了。哦。What are you doing? Why is he going gawk? We, we've got the dummy! Only hot sauce, Jojo! We, we've got the dummy! Gawk! He's saying gawk because he wants the dummy, but so my is flinging the dummy away. Mm-hmm. That nasty wants it. It's chili pepper. Yeah, it's chili pepper. Yes. I will. Right now, I will let you off the hook. Yeah. Yeah. Funny one. Yeah. Chili pepper is bad, but she said, right now, I will let you off the hook. Or on the hook, as the case may be. Tell you what, this time I'll let you off the hook. She said, she said, right now. Tell you what, this time I'll let you off the hook. You know what? This time I'll let you off the hook. Says the nice give pepper one. Or on the hook, as the case may be. As you can see how independent the reading experience is and how much in control of the whole process she is. Uh, and that's the interesting thing about reading off the iPad is, is, is the child's space and they control the pace of reading. It's quite different from actually book reading. So, <coughs> um, so right now this is where we are. Uh, as we, I mentioned earlier, uh, we are in available in various formats. We are trying to figure out how to put new features into each of uh, the apps. Um, apart from going to, to Android, we're trying to put in some um, games, vocabulary exercises, and some curriculum guides to, to boost, uh, uh, you know, to, to support the rest of, of the story and the learning experience as well. Um, and just because we are insecure as newbie publishers, we um, 
<laughs> we have to show you what some, you know, Jean We have to Jean show Yang. you some evidence that, you know, Eisner Award winner Jin Young likes it. And the best of all is, uh, to me anyway, is uh, uh, Chris, you know, Chris, Chris Claremont, whom I grew up with, uh, saying, you know, very, very nice things about us. Um, uh, that was actually when he donated all his writing to the Columbia University Library. So oh, all his X-Men. That's where uh, we met Rob. So, um, but I guess the biggest thrill is also seeing the kids actually reading um, Tim Sum Warriors. And, and, you know, here's, uh, that's actually, the big picture is actually of a school in Missouri who took delivery of a, a whole... Um, Some books. Yes, <laughs> set of books. And... So our dream, you know, our dream is to make Tim Sam Warriors into a movie. Uh, we have, uh, we are now in kind of various kinds of talks. Uh, we, we, we don't know when it's going to happen yet, but we yeah. think it Yen will. was just in China talking about it. Will but yeah, if you, but any of you want, you can download this as a wallpaper. It's, it's kind of fun. Just go, just go to the Tim Sam Warriors website. Uh, it's kind of a crazy dream. But the strangest thing just happened uh, barely two weeks ago. Yeah, um, so we are, we are currently in, officially in development for Tim Sam Warriors' stage musical with, uh, <laughs> yes. um, with a few kind of exciting rising stars in uh, the New York theatre scene. Um, so, yeah, we are very, very excited about that. Um, so hopefully, hopefully we'll, uh, yeah. we'll we see We would love to be, uh, you know, it's uh, not, not quite Spider-Man turn off the dark, but we definitely uh, are going to see some acrobatics and uh, fun, st uh, you know, flying dumplings. <laughs> And uh, who knows? Uh, one of the other things we didn't predict was that Dim Sum Warriors led us to open a yoga studio. <laughs> because, okay, the, you know, there's complete tangent. Uh, and again, the, the wonders of uh, creating is that you never know where it'll lead you. It certainly, I would never in my life uh, have thought it would lead us to opening a yoga studio. But basically, we got kicked out of our old office. We were sharing an office. Uh, with some other people who needed the extra space, and they said, oh, you know, move out, and we were looking around, and we happened to find a, a space that was just too big for uh, the two of us, and Yen said, I'm tired of driving to the next town to do yoga. Why don't we just open one? And it was kind of insane, but, uh, you know, it's, it's coming up to a year now, and... Uh, yeah. So it's called Yamcha Yoga because our publishing studio is called Yamcha Studios. Yamcha basically means going for dim sum, drinking tea. So you see in our logo, we have a dumpling, a peaceful dumpling in, in the middle. So um, the studio is now in Flushing, Queens, and we have a lot of dumpling art on the walls um, at Yamcha Yoga. Yes, <laughs> that's crazy. Yes, um, I, my suspicion is that she opened it so that I would have no excuse uh, not to dodge uh, working out. Um, and who knows what happens next? A little hint for you, Seattleites. Uh, <laughs> hot beverage business? Mm, maybe not. <laughs> anyway, um, yes, so uh, thank you once again, especially to uh, the University of Washington's Communications Leadership Program and Rob and Scott in particular uh, for inviting us to your lovely city. Uh, as Seattle is the birthplace of Bruce Lee, without whom none of our work would be possible, um, we have a special gift as well. So the first 10 people come and say hi to us and tell us their favorite dumpling. Uh, we will give you a print. That's a little homage to Enter the Dragon. So they're signed. So, so come and say hi. And uh, thank you once again. Thank you very much. Yes. Thank you, Colin and Yen Yen. Uh, come and sure get your prints. Be sure to check them out over and, and, Sally. and uh, definitely check out this app. It's really fun. And it's a... Um, a rare case of a um, of a thing that's created for children and as uh, works just as well for grown-ups too.